I know that some of you don't want to go back in time a few weeks, but I want to take you back to that vice presidential debate of our election. Current Vice President Mike Pence and our new Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, whoop, whoop, and of course, the famous fly. It was surreal. Well, I mean, it was kind of on par for the course of the election and for this year, but it was also odd. And some people were cheering on the fly, and I don't think any of us remembered what they were talking about at the time. But after it was all said and done, what was remarkable to me was that Pence didn't seem to notice. I was actually pitying the poor person who had to tell him about it after it was all done. David Frum is a staff writer at The Atlantic magazine and used to be a speechwriter for George W. Bush. Right after the debate, he wrote a brilliant article entitled the man who pretended not to notice. It was the final paragraph that summed it up perfectly for me and made created the foundation for this week's service. We saw a weird moment when a fly landed on Pence's snow white hair and the vice president did not react at all. No doubt it's, an, it's a conundrum what to do in such a situation. If Pence had shooed the fly and the fly had refused to shoo, well, that would have been bad. So he did nothing. And that doing nothing somehow in one powerful visual moment concentrated everything. It symbolized the whole Pence vice presidency, the determined willful refusal to acknowledge the most blaring and glaring negative realities. Through all of the scandals and the crimes and the disasters of the past four years, Mike Pence was the man who pretended not to notice. And now there was a fly on his head and he pretended not to notice that as well. In that moment, the not noticing became a huge metaphor for me because I see the connection between that and what distinguishes Unitarian Universalists as religious liberals, that we notice, we notice things. Now, I am very clear that I am talking about those of us who are religiously liberal. Again, I affirm that there is room in our tent for all of those who are politically conservative. There is sometimes an overlap between those who are religiously liberal and politically liberal, but not always. And I also want to talk about this as liberal tradition, liberal religious tradition, which is a big category and acknowledge that that doesn't always mean that it speaks for every single individual. But I want to have this opportunity to talk about religious liberalism in the largest sense. Unitarians and Universalists before they merged in 1961 were always religious liberals. They were on the cutting edge of theology, moving our theological thinking forward rather than staying in an orthodoxy or being focused on the past. James Luther Adams was one of the most influential Unitarian or Universalist theologians of the 20th century. He identified the five smooth stones of liberal religion. According to Adams, they are first, religious liberalism depends on the principle that revelation is continuous. Our religious tradition is a living tradition because we are always learning about new truths. Two, all relations between pe persons ought really to rest on mutual free consent and not coercion. We freely choose to enter into relationship with one another as our new member class represents today. Three, religious liberalism affirms the moral obligation to direct one's effort toward the establishment of a just and loving community. 
It is this that makes the role of the prophet central and indispensable in liberalism. It's the idea of justice. And when I say prophet, I'm not necessarily talking about a single prophet like Jesus or Muhammad, blessed be his name. I am saying it in the prophetic sense. We are the prophets. The fourth is we deny the immaculate conception of virtue and affirm the necessity of social incarnation, which is basically saying we all have agency. Good things don't just happen, people make them happen. And fifth, liberalism holds that the resources, both divine and human, that are available for the achievement of meaningful change justify an attitude of ultimate optimism. It's the idea of hope. So when we think about noticing, I actually think Stones three, the idea of directing our effort towards that just and loving community, and four, the necessity of social incarnation, that we make change happen and are dependent. That's all dependent on us being people who notice. We cannot make change and work towards justice if we don't notice what's going on. And I think this is a huge part of what is dividing us as a society these days. Like, I mean, sometimes I'm feeling like I'm in living in a totally alternative universe. Do you? Like, I feel like I'm seeing one reality and other people are seeing another. So I notice that we've lost 250,000 beautiful souls in this country to this disease. I mourn their loss. And I know that with every single one, I notice that there are people left behind who didn't get to say goodbye, who are still mourning, who may have not had funerals. I notice that our numbers are growing exponentially right now. I notice that the election, by, that by all reports was as free and fair as can be expected, is over. And there was somebody who won the election. I don't understand those who don't believe that that didn't happen. I notice racism in this country. I notice anti-Semitism. I notice homophobia and transphobia. I notice misogyny. I will not pretend it's not happening just to make people feel better or because it's too negative. I will notice it and name it until it doesn't exist anymore. I notice climate change. I believe the science. Like, I don't know, Texas, I know that you've all been experiencing some wild weather as well. Phoenix has as well. We see the polar ice caps melting, the number of hurricanes, and yet some people are disputing whether it's real. I notice the laws and policies that have real consequences for people. When you ban transgender people from the military, when you separate families at the border, when you ban people from Muslim countries from coming into the US, when you remove the US from climate treaties, I pay attention and I think about the ramifications of these collective actions. I don't do these things because I need to live in a negative world or I wanna be a downer. I notice them because they are real. And I am, and we are people who notice these things. Paul Razor is a more modern Unitarian Universalist theologian. He was recently the director of the Center for the Study of Religious Freedom, and he's written several books on liberal religion, most notably Faith Without Certainty, Liberal Religion, Liberal Theology in the 21st Century, which I highly recommend if you all want to dig in further into this. Razor also lays out some of the tenets of liberal religious thought, including free religious inquiry, openness to divergent views, and autonomous judgment about truth claims, right? He wrote the book in 2005, but it feels like it's handmade for us now. Free religious inquiry. We are free to explore what has religious meaning for us. We did not ask 
our new members today to sign on to a specific creed or statement to believe. We have the freedom to explore what that is for, it, for us. Openness to divergent views. We say that revelation is continuous. Uh, like James Luther, Ad, like Adam said, we are always learning and growing and becoming more of what we aspire to be. And then autonomous judgment without truth claims, right? This is one of the many reasons that I think that so many of us are feeling like it's difficult to separate the political world from the religious world right now. Because what we see happening in the political world just doesn't make sense to us in our worldview. As religious, moral, ethical beings, we believe in growth, we believe in compassion for all beings, and we believe that random people can't just say what truth is. We get to affirm that for ourselves. So random people saying that science isn't truthful or vote results are not real or what we notice is not true, it just doesn't compute with how we have our worldview. We notice, we see it, we assert for ourselves what is true and not true. We don't believe a figurehead just because they say something is true. Believe me, it would be a lot easier for me as a minister, if you did just believe everything that I said. But we know that we are inherently anti-authoritarian because it is our worldview to take in all of the information and assess for ourselves what has meaning and what is true for us. So here's the challenge of being people, religious people, regular worldview people who notice is that we can't not do it, but that doesn't make it easier. It would actually be much easier to not notice and go on our merry ways, but many of us just aren't wired for that. I'm going to admit that during the days of the election anxiety, I often switched channels over to Fox News. I know, I know, it was just to hear what they were saying. I was actually very heartened to hear that the numbers that I was looking at and the numbers that they were looking at were the same, but the commentary was pretty different. They spent a lot of time complaining about liberals. He was talking about political liberals, by the way. But I remember one random discussion where a commentator was making fun of liberals and comparing the different views of the world to buildings. So I'm paraphrasing, I went back to look for it, but I'm not going to search too long for it. So I'm paraphrasing and he said, conservatives are like a shop in the mall. So politics is one of the shops. There are other shops like family and work, and church and hobbies, and politics is just one of them. So you can close that shop and carry on with your life just fine. It's just one of the many things that can, that define the life of somebody who is conservative. What an overgeneralization, by the way. But liberals, for him, he said it was like the ground floor of a skyscraper. If you take out politics, then he said their whole foundation just falls down and the world falls apart. So I may debate that we don't have just as powerful and important relationships with our families, friends, religious communities, and hobbies. But I also mean, like, he's totally not wrong because we are a people who notice. How convenient to be a people who can just close the shop door and not care what happens because you know that you and yours will be fine. It's honestly, he was defining a big sign of white upper class straight privilege right there to just say, I'm turning off politics right now and I'm not going to think about it. It doesn't worry me right now. But we know that the policies and statements and laws make real world difference to people. In fact, most often those who we are trying to notice the most. So yes, we do react strongly as if the foundation is being ripped out because we believe that human dignity, equality and justice is foundational. It is the foundation. We notice who that affects, even if it might not be ourselves personally. 
There may be a time when we need to take a break from noticing everything. Over and over this year, I've been encouraging people to turn off the news. There is a big difference between being clueless and taking in every piece of information and opinion over and over again. We need to notice what is happening inside ourselves as well as what is happening outside. We need to notice the status of our mental health, our physical body, our spiritual practices, our own emotional grounding. And I wanna give a special shout out to those of you who have changed your Thanksgiving plans for this week because you have noticed what the science says and you're making an intentional and safe choice. I know that this noticing has a very deep cost either way. And I am holding space for you all this week as your long weekend looks different. So I'm inviting you and encouraging you to really notice it. Take the time to really notice what is most important. I would hazard a guess that it is not really about the consistency of the mashed potatoes or if you have the right china out. I think we have all noticed this year that it is about the people, the simple things like hugs, easy conversation, laughter, and feeling connected. As you are noticing what is happening in the outside world, make sure you are noticing what is happening inside you this year. What has been expendable and what hasn't? What has real meaning for you? And what was trappings of society's expectations, family expectations, or your own? What at your core is important to you? We are going to need to lock in these noticings, these observations, so that someday when this is all over, we can recreate our lives in a more meaningful and intentional way. And make sure that you notice all the things that you are also grateful for, the abundance that still exists in your life. I have delighted in noticing all of you through this. And Wildflower, I am loving having you here and seeing your comments and noticing you too. I see your triumphs and struggles, how people have come together in new and meaningful ways, how you have welcomed new people, how we have made our communities more like the world we wish to live in, even when that's not easy. May all of this noticing be true for you now, through this weekend, and as we get through all of these times together. <laughs>